What's up, everyone? It's Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know, and today we are breaking down this 60-page motion filed by R. Kelly's lawyers asking for a judgment of acquittal to let him go home because the government should not have charged him with RICO because they could not fit his facts to the law. And we talked a lot about this in the beginning of the case. This was kind of a weird charge, and it was unusual for you know, this sexual abuse enterprise that they were trying to prove as the government. So we mentioned that early on. There was fights about it um, in the pre-trial arguments and motions in the case, but the judge allowed it to go forward. It went to trial. And as we all know, he was convicted of those RICO charges. So I have not read this motion. We are going to look through it together today and get just kind of immediate reactions. But to help me with that, because I've never tried a RICO case myself, I decided to bring someone in that has tried RICO cases, understands how they work, and actually gave me some insight that this is not as unusual as a lot of us may think for a RICO charge to be applied to something that is not organized crime, which is what most of us think of when we talk about RICO. And we're going to hear in the motion how that's kind of the legislative intent for creating this RICO charge. Um, so we're going to talk through it today. And I brought in case you can't tell the camera angle being a little weird. Big George is here with us today. And we are going to work through this together. He hasn't read it either. So um, we are going to break it down as we go. But this is R. Kelly's motion for a judgment of acquittal. I'm going to share my screen here. If you haven't already, while I'm figuring out how to share my screen, hit the like button and subscribe to our page if you haven't already. Um, people were asking for all of this R. Kelly content, so we are bringing it to you. Um, and my dad may have to leave in the middle of the video. If he does, we will just continue on. But here we go. 60 pages. Buckle up. <sighs> All right. Table of contents. How we show this is kind of what the, the entirety of the argument is going to be a little bit of a summary. The government failed to prove the defendant guilty of the offense of racketeering count one. And then it breaks down basically the entire racketeering definition and statute. And I'm going to be reading it. So my dad will probably interrupt me when he has a point and everybody complains that we interrupt each other. It's OK. I told him to interrupt me as I'm reading because I'm trying to get through this whole document. The government's proof did not establish an enterprise, which we know that's a big part of RICO, a common purpose. The enterprise distinct from racketeering activities, person enterprise rule. The government failed to prove the so-called enterprises activities affected interstate commerce. And the government's proof did not establish a pattern of racketeering. And they go through all the racketeering acts that he was charged with. Um, and then they talk about the Mann Act violations. And the last one, which is funny, which we're really not even going to talk about today. It's one paragraph. The government failed to prove counts two through nine of the indictment. Literally, the paragraph says the government failed to, prov to prove a prima facie case of this. And that's the entirety of it. So we have 55 pages arguing about whether or not RICO is appropriate. And then one page for counts two through nine. So even if you were to win the RICO and lose counts two through nine, I think you'd still be in trouble. But... Let's jump to it. We see here in these cut types of motions, always the cases that they cite, all the research they've done. And like I said in the last video, as we read through this motion, I expect you to be nodding your head and thinking they're going to win because when lawyers do all this research and cite all these cases and make arguments, it always seems like they're making a winning argument. But one of them loses every time. And we'll see at the end of the video what our guess will be as to whether or not R. Kelly's lawyers will be successful here. Has the government filed their response yet? Not that I've seen. Okay. So again, the same thing with the other motion. We didn't see the government's response, but a lot of this stuff was handled pre-trial as well. You just haven't seen or read the motions that were done pre-trial and they've already been ruled against, which makes it difficult for them to win. Now, the really the most interesting one to me that we talked about a little bit was the voir dire issues and the people that got on the jury. We've already done that video. Um, and actually we're recording this Friday before our live where Pete and I are going to talk about the conflict of interest of his lawyer, um, which is the second part of the motion for new trial. But again, we're going to focus this video on this JOA on the RICO charges. So in the introduction, Fitzgerald v. Chrysler, Chief Judge Posner, who's a famous chief judge in law school, we read a lot of his um, rulings back in the day, cautioned that where a statute is broadly worded in order to prevent loopholes from being drilled in it by ingenious lawyers, there is a danger of being applied to situations absurdly remote from the concerns of the statute's framers. Such is the case here where the government misused both the racketeer influence and corporate organization statute, RICO, and the Mann Act in a matter never previously conceived or carried out. 
So basically his lawyers are using this just rule of law that you shouldn't allow it to be too broad on these statutes to say that that's what happened here. We'll see whether or not we agree. Invigorated by an influential social movement determined to punish centuries of male misbehavior through symbolic prosecutions of high profile men, the government brought a RICO prosecution against the defendants that was absurdly remote from the drafter's intent, stretching the liberal construction clause well beyond the intent of Congress. The government constructed RICO um, not to effectuate a purpose of RICO statute, but to prosecute the defendant for alleged misdeeds going back decades without pesky statutes of limitations obstacles. So again, in all of these motions, in all of these cases, they've bashed the Me Too movement saying that, I mean, they even literally say the symbolic prosecutions as if they are not legitimate. Adding to its history of celebrity Man Act prosecutions, the government extended the body, the broad language of the Man Act con to conduct its never intended to remedy, to conduct it was never intended to remedy. While the Man Act may be effective a tool for combating human trafficking, it was not designed to punish sexual misconduct like that alleged of the defendant. Where the defendant's alleged transportation of females, largely consenting adults, was incidental to his travels as a world-renowned performer, he is not guilty of Man Act violations. If the government intends to prosecute Man Act violations in the fashion it did here, it might consider investigating many influential, wealthy, mostly white corporate leaders who frequently arrange travel for paramours who later conclude that the experience was less than pleasant. We're also getting a bit of the race um, argument here that because R. Kelly's African American as a black influential R and B star, he is getting targeted versus his white counterparts. Now Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein, and we've seen some on uh, Glenn Maxwell even that are on both sides of the race debate. But you know whatever they're trying to use everything they can in this. A detat, and I know that there are a lot of people out there that do think this is purely about race. I don't think it's purely about race. Race may have something to do with it, but I think it's purely about what R. Kelly did, and we'll talk about more in this motion, how um, I'm sure they're going to bring up the fact that how we talk about the generally bad guy rule um, and how they just wanted to pile on all these bad acts and they tried to fit them in to the RICO statute and the Man Act. A detached and unemotional review of the evidence in this case shows that the government presented an overabund overabundance of bad character evidence to compensate for its insufficient proofs of the specific elements of RICO and the Man Act. Accordingly, this court must acquit the defendant. Like I said, the bad character evidence is really what they focused on more than anything else. The relevant facts just basically go through what the charges are, but because uh, the record is so long, they're going to incorporate the relevant facts into the argument section. So let's get to the argument section. This court must set aside the verdict of guilt entered against the defendant and enter a judgment of acquittal where the government presented insufficient evidence of the racketeering offense, the Man Act offense. Jury returned a guilty verdict. The court may set aside the guilty verdict and enter an acquittal. So again, this isn't just asking for a new trial at this point. They're asking for him to be acquitted of these charges. Uh, a judge or a court can only enter this judgment um, if sufficient evidence, only if after viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution, who's the non-moving party, and drawing all reasonable inferences in the government's favor, it concludes no rational trier of fact could have found the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Why don't you explain that standard? Well, the standard is you can't throw a case out. Well, you said the difference between a new trial, asking for a new trial, and totally throwing a case out so he won't have a new trial. That means he'll never be charged again and he can walk free forever. Everything has to be in the, looked at in light most favorable to the government's evidence, which means if you got Joe saying he didn't do it and Bob saying he did do it, the when you're doing this motion for judgment of acquittal, you only can look at Bob saying he did do it. You can't weigh the evidence. You can't weigh the credibility and say, okay, this guy's lying and this guy's telling the truth. You have to assume this guy's telling the truth when it's on the government side of the case so that you don't have courts becoming juries and making a decision, weighing the evidence to find somebody guilty or not guilty. In this case, you have to take a look at all the government's evidence only and find out no reasonable juror could ever find a person guilty based on this evidence. And that's it's a very high burden. And that's why it's so hard for them to win um, stuff like this. It's basically like saying, if everything the government's witnesses said were true, they still could not have proved these charges. That's the point. That's how you look at it. Is if everything all of the government witness said was true, it still doesn't fit into RICO, which is what they're trying to argue here. And that's why they're mostly unsuccessful. 
To sustain a conviction, the jury must have been able to find each of the essential elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. As set out in detail before, the RICO conviction cannot stand. Let's get into it. Government failed to prove the defendant is guilty of the offense of racketeering. Count one. This court must acquit the defendant of the offense of racketeering where the government failed to, to prove the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of each and every element of the offense. They swamped the jury with bad character evidence, and that's exactly what they did. That was guaranteed to produce a guilty verdict, but it's proof. It's proofs on the charges. I'm sorry. On the charged offenses were insufficient as a matter of law, ignoring the distinctly economic legislative history of RICO statute. The government brought a RICO prosecution against the defendant, not to remedy widespread criminal activity of an enterprise, but to punish one man whose alleged crimes could no longer be prosecuted by state and local agencies. The government's belated interest in protecting defendants, alleged victims does not justify the application of the RICO statute to alleged private sexual misconduct of the defendant. Hold on, before you get there, how many cases do you feel like we try in criminal cases where all they do is pile a bunch of bad acts of the criminal on them? Well, it's of the fine. defendant on And them. I think you've got to, again, we have to, uh, they're being a little bit disingenuous in their argument right. because they're saying this is all character evidence, when in fact, these are all independent charges. The, all of these uh, ladies that were charged were charged in Man Act violations. Uh, therefore, it was not, they didn't introduce them as character witnesses to show bad character. They were introduced as victims of a crime. But what I'm and saying is, distinction. right. But what I'm saying is, how many cases do you have where you feel like they're putting on evidence just to make the defendant look bad? Of course they are. And we always object to, and throughout this trial, we said that. I was make, I was saying, why does that do with anything? The fact that he, you know, made a girl like poop in a bucket or something like that. That has nothing to do with the man act. That but, was, to... but was that girl a victim of one of the counts? Correct. Yes. So An her activities, victim, yes. So her activities while she was with him are relevant to show her credibility. For instance, I'm sure she got up there and testified and she testified about what she did with him. And yes, of course it's going to be bad. Of course it's going to be negative. I mean, the government is not going to put on a victim that's going to say good things about the defendant. Right. So every victim that testifies testifies that things that are bad character of the defendant. Right. But what I'm saying is that's not unusual. That happens in literally every case every, where every all case. the evidence they put on is bad acts of the defendant. They try to make the defendant look as bad as possible. The generally bad guy rule means the judge usually lets them make the defendant look bad. Right. Okay. But in this case, when they're talking about character... They're talking about 404B. They're trying to make it look like a 404B argument, which is introducing evidence of other bad acts that aren't relevant to the crime charge. Correct. That's not what happened here. Well, there was some of that, I think. I think there was some argument and testimony that was like not necessary or not necessarily relevant to these charges, but they still let it in under, like you're saying, some of the... Because just because a victim, something happened to a victim doesn't make it relevant to this charge. If a victim is with the defendant and during that time, all of these sexual acts occurred, well, the fact that during a 30 minute period, she pooped in a bucket, there's no reason to cut out a 30 minute period. I disagree. Contact. I mean, I disagree. I would argue that that should be cut out because that makes him look horrible and has nothing to do with Rico. Well, in that case, you don't argue the character evidence. You would argue more prejudicial again, 403 evidence, right. which is more prejudicial than probative. And therefore, the judge should keep it out because it's got no probative value. Right. It doesn't prove anything. And that's my point. Right. And while... Uh, Defense lawyers are going to think some of that comes out in every case, right? I mean, we are going to always think that comes out in every case. This lawyer is doing a good job writing this motion, but a lot of lay people that don't ever read these kinds of motions are going to be shocked by some of this. But this type of stuff happens in every case. And we think that evidence comes out that shouldn't in literally every case. And the prosecutor thinks we get to get into things that we shouldn't. So this happens in every case. All right. As a reminder, Rico's, as a reminder, Rico's primary purpose was to combat organized crime by prosecuting the highly diversified acts of a single organized crime enterprise under the RICO's umbrella. The overcharging goal of the statute was to curb the infiltration of legitimate businesses, organizations by racketeers. In the statement of finding and purposes accompanying the RICO statute, Congress, Congress declared the following. This means what was the intent of the RICO statute when Congress created it? And we talk a lot about rules on this show about how they're created, what we do, how we make arguments, how we change certain words, what our point is. And whenever we make a rule, we think, what problem is it solving? So this lawyer pointed out that Congress finds that organized crimes in the United States, meaning like mobs and gangs, 
highly sophisticated, diversified, and widespread activity that annually drains billions of dollars from the American economy by unlawful conduct and the illegal use of force, fraud, and corruption. Organized crime derives a major portion of its power through money obtained through illegal endeavors, syndicated gambling, loan sharking, theft and fencing of property, importation and distribution of narcotics and dangerous drugs, other forms of social exploitation. The money is increasingly used to infiltrate corrupt and corrupt legitimate businesses and labor unions. And then this just continues to talk about how it was focused on organized crimes. Okay. So dad, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, now you can jump into kind of what you think about Rico save what other cases Rico has been used on? Because I think that's very interesting. We'll talk about that at the end where you can see other things that you'd be very surprised to hear that this Rico statute has been applied to, but just your general thoughts on Rico. I know you said you've heard people lecture on it. Well, yes. And I have heard the, the guy who wrote it, uh, Professor Blakey from the uh, University of Notre Dame, uh, when I was with the Department of Justice, he would teach us a class on, on Rico. And he has had been used in appellate arguments on other cases because he will tell you Rico was designed for organized crime activity. Rico was written specifically because they weren't able to get the bosses of the five crime families in New York. And they needed to figure out a way to get up to them and because they were so insulated. So he designed RICO. If you go to countries like Switzerland, and, and I've been to Switzerland for the Department of Justice, they have no concept of RICO, and it, they're horrified by RICO because RICO doesn't actually directly charge somebody with commission of a crime. It charges them as being a member of an organization that committed crimes. So they have no concept of what it's like in foreign countries or a European sense of justice. But we got it. We have it in the United States. It's rather unique. It was certainly unique when Blakely wrote it, and it has uh, been used. And I said, Blakely will testify, and he has testified, and he has written law review articles on why it was written and how broad it's been interpreted. Okay, so the defense even contends that the, the government has used RICO in a wide variety of circumstances under this liberal construction. But it was not an invitation to apply RICO to new purposes that Congress never intended. The government clearly exceeded those limits in this case. To sustain a conviction of RICO, they must prove one, through the commission, sorry, prove that the defendant won, through the commission of two or more acts constituting a pattern of racketeering activity, two, directly or indirectly invested in, maintained an interest in, or participated in an enterprise, three, the activities of which affected interstate or foreign commerce. As set out below, the government offered insufficient proof of all the elements. They did not prove and did not establish an enterprise. The government's case was doomed from the start when it failed to plead and prove an enterprise. Enterprise includes an individual, partnership, corporation, association, or other legal entity, and any union or group of individuals associated, in fact, although not a legal entity. The United States Supreme Court has defined RICO Enterprise as a group of persons associated together for a common purpose of engaging in a course of conduct. An enterprise is demonstrated by evidence of an ongoing organization, formal or informal, and by evidence that various associates function as a continuing unit. For an association of individuals to constitute an enterprise, the individuals must share a common purpose to engage in a particular fraudulent course of conduct and work together to achieve such purposes. The enterprise is neither the individual defendant nor the pattern of racketeering activity, rather an entity separate and apart from the pattern of activity in which engaged and must be alleged and proved separately. However, there must be a nexus between the enterprise and the racketeering activity that is being conducted. Furthermore, the RICO enterprise must have an ascertainable structure separate and distinct from the pattern of racketeering activities. Finally, purposes the person for a 1962C purposes, the person charged with a RICO violation and the alleged enterprise must be separate and distinct from one another. This requirement flows from the statutory mandate that a person who engaged must be employed by or associated with. So talk a little bit about how this could or couldn't be an enterprise. R. Kelly's ring of sexual behavior where he had people reaching out to girls, giving them money, setting up, flying here and there, staying in his houses, um, you know, had the sexual activity going on, some of them being minors. Um, explain how that could or couldn't be Rico and why charging R. Kelly is okay or not okay since he kind of is the enterprise almost, even though he's the individual person. Well, first off, not everybody in the enterprise has to know that they're conducting criminal activity. So I think it's important to realize that Art Kelly and his association with other people, those other people didn't have to know that there was criminal activity going on, that this, these Man Act violations were going on. That's first. 
Secondly, this group existed independent of the individual Art Kelly. In other words, there was an Art, even though it might be called the same thing, there was an Art Kelly group for curing women, but it wasn't necessarily Art Kelly the individual. So the enterprise, and, and I'm, I'm curious because I, I also have not read this yet, how they are going to distinguish the fact that there was a group, uh, there was an enterprise, and I didn't really, I don't really know, and uh, you know more than I do probably about the individuals, but how many individuals were involved? Were there 20 people? There's a thing called a spoke conspiracy where was Art Kelly like at the center of things and all these people kind of went on like a spoke like wheels. That's basically what it was, yeah, because yeah. he had like people that would manage his house and and set up the plane tickets for the girls and then he would have people that were at his concerts that would find okay. girls, give them a $20 bill or something so with a number. He's just a central so, figure. Or not a $20, a card with their number yeah, on Every kind of spoke went out from him as a central of, figure. yeah. That's a classic organization. That's what they. That's what they. And, try and to so uh, that's a classic organization, and it's independent of him, and it's independent of the crimes. It's an organization that exists and functions. Yeah, here we go. Here's a good explanation of it right here. In the third superseding indictment, the government alleged that the defendant and his employees, managers, bodyguards, drivers, personal assistant, and runners, and other members of his entourage, constituted an enterprise for RICO purposes. According to the government, the purpose of the enterprise was to one promote the defendant's music and his brand Two, recruit women and girls to engage in illegal sexual activity with the defendant and three produce pornography, including child pornography. The indictment did not allege that the enterprise constituted a legal entity, but rather an association of individuals. Okay, let's, let's talk for a second. Cause that that's classic drug in, uh, insert drug dealer in there. All right. Here is the head of a drug organization. He had runners, he had bodyguards, right? He had people taking care of his house. Uh, just because this is not drugs doesn't make the organization less an organization or less an enterprise. All right. For association of individuals to constitute an enterprise, the individual must share a common purpose to engage in a particular fraudulent course of conduct and work together to achieve such purposes, like a drug deal. Thus, for the government to establish an enterprise here is required to prove the defendant and his employees on trial together at a common purpose of recruiting women and girls to engage in illegal sexual activity and produce pornography, not merely the broader purpose of promoting defendant's music or brand. Assuming the defendant's employees and entourage did share a common objective of promoting the defendant's music, that objective has no nexus to the underlying racketeering activity. Defendant did not go through all the trouble of becoming a world-famous R&B star for purpose of engaging in illegal, illegal sexual activity. Even if his job put him in proximity to women, the government cannot end run the common purpose requirement by identifying a broad activity of an enterprise unrelated to fraudulent activity with no nexus to the racketeering activity. I, I, I think that's a, a weak argument. Yes, maybe the primary focus was to um, do his music and to do his brand, but it doesn't mean that it did not contribute to his ability to get women. The government's evidence of an enterprise was insufficient because it failed to establish the defendant's employees on trust shared the common purpose. Notably, it does not define illegal sexual activity, but based on the predicate acts charged by the government, contends the defendant's employees on trust shared an objective of ensuring that the defendant had his sexual needs met by women, some but not all underage women. They're, I mean, I guess they're agreeing that some were underage. While at home and while traveling, was able to control these women's sexual conduct, government deems abusive, videotaped sexual encounters with these women. It's just some of the facts. Conceitedly, the government offered evidence that the defendant's various employees carried out some tasks related to connecting the defendant to women with whom he had personal, even sexual relationships with, or women he was interested in having sexual relationship with. These tasks included providing defendants' phone numbers to women who attended his concert, inviting them to after parties, et cetera, et cetera. See, However, again, his brand and his music contributed to the fact that he was able to commit the crimes. However, the record is devoid of evidence that the members of the enterprise acted with the common objective of ensuring that defendants engage in illegal activity. So you said before they don't have to know that it's a criminal. They don't have to know it's a criminal act to for part of the enterprise to be part of the enterprise. How is and it a you, common if, purpose then? If, I would if think you go up, if you go up, what you just where you just said. Defendant engaged in illegal sexual activity. So they knew that what they were doing activity, was sexual activity. But not that That's why they highlighted the illegal point there. But they had to know that it was sexual activity. Yes, they okay. knew it. Because that the, yeah, the, the common that. purpose is they knew it was sexual activity. Right. Their common purpose doesn't have to know that it's illegal. Right, right. It is true that RICO does not have a mens rea requirement beyond what is necessary for pro proving the predicate crimes. There's your answer. Right. But where the government's evidence of an enterprise centers on its claims that the associated, in fact, members shared a common purpose for ensuring the defendant's illegal sexual activities. The government must offer evidence that the members of the enterprise knew that their actions were promoting not just legal sexual activities, but illegal sexual activities. 
you would disagree with that. I would. I would because right above that, on top of the mens rea, you know, they don't have an, they don't have to have an intent that this was illegal sexual activity. They knew they're promoting sexual activity. So that might be something the government then disagrees with that. Right. They're arguing they had to know it was illegal. Government's arguing they did not have to know it was illegal, just they were promoting sexual not activity. Not everybody has to know it was illegal. Right. The defendant obviously does. Right. The defendant is not claiming that each member of the enterprise must. Here we go. This is so funny how because this is obvious that we haven't read this yet since we're talking about exactly what's coming up next. <laughs> the defendant is not claiming that each member of the enterprise must have possessed knowledge about every predicate act that the defendant is alleged to have committed. But the government cannot prove a common purpose without showing that the members of the enterprise shared an understanding of what the purpose of the enterprise was, which, according to the government, was promoting illegal sexual activity and producing pornography. Despite its bullying tactics, the government's came up short on evidence that all defendants' employees who made up this vague enterprise were working in continuing unit. I mean, she's, she's disagreeing with herself in this motion, in my opinion. No employee testified that they understood their purpose was to recruit underage women, nor did any of the enterprise present any testimony that they had any knowledge about the defendant's herpes diagnosis. That's another part of it, that he was knowingly giving these people herpes. That he practiced unsafe, unsafe sex or videotaped his sexual experiences. The government can point to no evidence that any employee possessed specific information about precisely what transpired in the defendant's bedroom once he was alone with the female guests, even if they knew he expected his guests to follow strict, even controlling rules and possess recording devices like iPads and iPhones, it does not follow that the members of the enterprise shared a goal of promoting illegal activity. We've been over that. All right. Enterprise distinct from racketeering activities. To the extent the government argues that its evidence showed that the members of the enterprise shared a common purpose, had knowledge of promoting the defendant's illegal sexual conduct, the government failed to demonstrate that the purpose of the enterprise was distinct from the racketeering activities. Person enterprise rule. Uh, they have to prove that the defendant was distinct from the enterprise, clearly envisions that the person and the enterprise will be distinct. The requirement focuses on the culpability, the culpable party, and recognizes that the enterprise itself is often passive instrument or victim of racketeering activity. The Supreme Court has held that the Rigo defendant must have participated in the conduct of the enterprise's affairs, not just his own affairs. Government cannot plead its way around the distinctness requirement. The defendant's inner circle and introduce a series of headshots of the defendant's former employees as evidence of an enterprise. Because the government's RICO prosecution under this fact pattern is entirely unique, there is a dearth of factually analogous authority on the issue, meaning not a lot of it. In certain cases, they claim that through acts of extortion and mail fraud, the defendant coerced the victim to restructure loan agreements between Riverwoods and Westchester. Riverwood's purse probably, so they're just kind of going through what this case showed. They intended to dishonor the existing agreement. They engaged in extortive behavior in the complaint. They alleged through a pattern of racketeering that Marine Midland and two of its loan officers participated in the affairs. The enterprise known as the restructuring group. And the Second Circuit reiterated that under the plain language of Rico, a person must conduct affairs of the RICO enterprise through a pattern of racketeering that the person in the enterprise must be distinct. Again, they're just kind of showing they have to be distinct. Let's see how they apply that to this case. The court found that in that case, they had failed to prove the distinctness requirement. The court observed that because the corporation can only function through its employees and agents, any act of the corporation can be viewed as an act of such an enterprise and the enterprise in reality, no more than the defendant itself. All right. The Riverwoods court scoffed at the notion that the plaintiff seriously contended that the actions of the restructuring group were anything other than the activities of Marine Mainland, Midland. Both the allegations of the complaint and the proof at trial showed that the individual members of the restructuring group were employed by Marine Midland at the relevant times. Those employees were acting within the scope of their authority as officers of Midland and all of the actions taken by the restructuring group, such as negotiating and executing the restructured loan and exacting personal guarantees from Shapiro were undertaken on behalf of Marie Midland, were just directly related to the bank's business. <sighs> There's a lot here. This is just all legal. Arguments. Yeah, this is just all legal arguments saying they have to be distinct. Let's get to where she... Here we go. Applying the, the rules... Of the foregoing case, the government failed to prove an enterprise distinct from the defendant by alleging RICO enterprise that consists of the defendant and his own employees, agents carrying on his affairs, namely promoting his brand, his music, his sexual needs, 
the government fails to satisfy, satisfy the distinct requirement. Put differently, because the government alleged defendants' employees associated together for no purpose other than to carry out the defendant's needs, including his illegal sexual activity, the employees did not form an enterprise distinct from the defendant. The defendant and the alleged enterprise were one in the same. What do you think about that? Uh, well, let me give you some examples, and, and these are related to cases that I've tried, uh, both the prosecutor and a defendant. A lot of these cases are legitimate corporations. Uh, for instance, a grocery store, legitimate grocery store, owned 100%, not, not even a corporation, just 100% by one man. During his operation, the grocery store, he had employees, he had delivery people, he had all sorts of things going on. He was selling untaxed cigarettes. And the government indicted him for racketeering. The enterprise was a legitimate grocery store owned 100 percent by the defendant. So, you know, this this argument really. So I guess it's like the brand versus the person almost. Yeah, th this the brand in the be... sexual ring versus the person like the grocery store versus the owner of the grocery store. Right. So basically, R. Kelly is the owner of the enterprise is what the government's going to argue. And, and this is you know maybe a good argument. The problem that they're going to have is that the court, when looking at this argument, has to look at the argument in the way that the most favorable to the government's evidence. And therefore, he's not weighing the evidence of, is this a good or bad enterprise? The government presented an enterprise, and that enterprise did commit acts through a through the defendant, R. Kelly. I actually think that's a good argument. The I think that's a good argument for the defendant, in this case, the distinctness, because it's I could see how it's not distinct and it's just kind of one and the same, which is why it was hard for me to wrap my mind around why they would use racketeering for this. I still think it's weird. I still don't necessarily think it's good and something that should be a good precedent center that they can use racketeering for this. Now, human trafficking and things like that, absolutely. Well, yes, I, mean, I agree with you. This racketeering wasn't made for this. Correct. They did this in order to hammer him. Right, exactly. But, but the, the, the case law, which I'm sure is what the uh, court relied on when the court denied these. Well, I'm sure they made these motions. Exactly. The court. Denied on is the fact that although it may be have been written for one particular purpose, you've got to take a look at the way it's written, the way Congress passed it. And if Congress passed it in such a way where a legitimate interpretation gives put people on notice of what racketeering is, then it can be used for a broader purpose than what it was actually written for. And that happens in a lot of statutes. The government failed to prove that the so-called enterprise activities affected interstate commerce. This is kind of simple. I'm going to go through this case law pretty quickly. Any person associated with enterprise engaged in or the activities which affect interstate or foreign commerce to conduct or participate directly or indirectly in the conduct of such enterprise affairs through a pattern of racketeering. Uh, engaged in commerce. Go ahead. There's a summary at the end. Because... I know, but oh, I don't want to just skip and then have to go back. So let okay. me just skim real quick. United States Supreme Court has determined that an enterprise is engaged in commerce when it is directly engaged in the production, distribution, or acquisition of goods or services in interstate commerce, meaning between states, multiple and, and states. And that's not the only way you can be engaged in foreign interstate commerce. That was just that particular It case. says, however, however, consistent with the liberal construction, some courts have held that the enterprise need only have a de minimum effect on interstate commerce, meaning just a very little bit. The court instructed this jury, consistent with the view that the government need only prove that it had a minimal effect on interstate commerce. Some cases have said that if you send a letter through the U.S. Postal Service during your you know, promoting your criminal activity, that's enough of an impact in interstate commerce. Saying, assuming in this case they did do it to even show a minimum effect, they didn't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. That's basically her argument here. Again, they're, then they're trying to put the judge in place of the jury to make the judge determination of whether it was proved beyond a reasonable doubt. And they've already admitted that's not the reason for this motion. It's not the burden. While the government may and did argue that the defendant's activity centered around promoting and performing his music affected interstate commerce, which it did, of course, they don't have any connection. Those charges um, are not tethered to those activities, the racketeering charges. But again, so there, this defense and defense attorney is trying to separate all the issues. The government married his brand, his music, his sexual activity, and all of the, the criminal sexual activity together as one. So they're trying to separate it. The de minimis, de minimis effect approach here amounts to unconstitutional extension of Congress's commerce power. They're not going to win on that. 
like you said, I mean, it doesn't take much to get that diminished no, no, effect. No, no. So they're not going to win on this one. Um, the first wave of expansion extended RICO in areas of government and corporate corruption. During the 1980s, federal prosecutors used RICO to prosecute corrupt corporate officers, state officials, and judges. A second wave saw prosecutors prosecute violent gangs. Bless you. Until the late 1980s, uh, murder was rarely prosecuted in federal court. But since the federal prosecutions have used RICO to bring down murder, murders, motorcycle gangs, white supremacist groups, and ethnic street gangs. They're just talking about how they're extending it. And again, if you're talking about you know white supremacists, what is their you know thing? If the murders white supremacists, how does that affect interstate commerce? Well, also go back and look at this when they were complaining about the fact that it was written for organized crime. Mm -hmm. All right. Then white supremacists would have the same argument. Exactly. Hey, when they wrote it, nobody uh, was thinking about white same thing with motorcycle gangs right. and things like that. Right. Um, all right. No economic, no economic motive driving these activities. And see, that is just a misstatement. There does not have to be an economic motive for all of the activities. There has to be the economic effect. So that's one of the things that when you read these motions and it sounds really good, but then you dig in a little bit and it's not quite there. All right. Government's proof did not establish a pattern of racketeering. Let's see. I'm curious about this. Predicate one. acts must bear a relationship to each other that manifests the continuity required to prove a pattern. And that's the focus. Um, inapplicable to predators of isolated and sporadic criminal acts. Criminal conduct only forms a pattern if it embraces criminal acti criminal acts that are related. And again, this may be why the court found it was relevant, the poop in the bucket and all the rules of the house and having to lock well, them in and they couldn't talk to guys and they couldn't do certain things and could do certain things. Well, again, substitute drug dealer here because I guess this sounds great in an isolated way talking about this, but substitute drug dealer. Drug transaction A happened on June, drug transaction B in a, in a different state or maybe in a different place. All right. The fact that they're happened in different places at different times with different people doesn't make them isolated, doesn't make them isolated because it's all one organization. The fact that he had sex with women on different dates well, and then, and, or and different he, places, multiple women talk, talk about how it was over like a 10, 15 year period of time. So like uh, I, that, I, that's yeah. the pattern I think that they're that the government's going with here. All right. Horizontal relatedness can be shown if the acts have the same or similar purpose, results, participants, victims, or methods of commission or otherwise are interrelated by distinguishing characteristics or not isolated events, which is what I think the government would argue here. Vertical relatedness requires only that the defendant was enabled to commit the offense solely because of his position in the enterprise of his involvement in or control over the enterprise's affairs or because the offense related to the activities of the enterprise, which I think, again, the government would argue here. Uh, with regard to continuity requirement, the government must present evidence regarding the timing and temporal scope of the alleged racketeering acts to demonstrate either closed or open-ended continuity, criminal activity that occurred over a long period of time in the past has closed ended continuity, regardless of whether it may have may or not have extended in the future. Again, people should realize when they're looking at this, they're pulling out a phrase from a case and sticking it in there without who knows what was before that phrase, after that phase, what the context was. That's what the government's going to do in their re reply is they're going to show the context of these cases, because I'm sure the fact pattern is not just like the Art Kelly case. In contrast, criminal activity that by its nature projects into the future with the threat of repetition, possesses open-ended continuity, and that can be established in several ways. Some crimes may be, by their very nature, a future threat. When the business of an enterprise is primarily unlawful, the continuity of the enterprise itself projects criminal activity into the future. Similarly, criminal activity is continuous when the predicate acts were regularly the way of operating business, even if business itself is primarily lawful. The government failed to demonstrate the pattern of act. I disagree. I, I don't, that was not a great one put together, in my opinion. Racketeering Act 1, bribery. Let me see here. I don't want to go through all these racketeering acts in detail. Paid employee $500 in connection with the Aaliyah marriage. Type table bullying pervaded Smith examination suggested that his testimony may be pressured by the government. Again, that argument does not work here in a JOA. 
right? Yes. I mean, that, that just doesn't work here. When you spoke to the group, as you testified on direct examination, when you spoke to the group about acquiring the ID, welfare office of Leah for money, the defendant was there, right? I'm pretty sure I think so, but I'm not. I'm not positive. Even if I said it before, I'm not positive. I just don't see that in my head right now. And that isn't a bad argument for the government in that this operation was ongoing. And at first I said, the operation is just the individual. That was their argument earlier and nothing else. Yet the operation wasn't just the individual because they even are throwing in there themselves that there's a doubt whether Art Kelly even knew they paid the $500. So the organization does operate independent of him as an individual. Well, they said like he couldn't even read and stuff. So people were having to read for him and uh... yeah. No rash. So they're basically saying this testimony was so bad and so back and forth that no juror could have um, ever thought it was true or thought what he was saying was true to convict for bribery. Again, to me, if you're viewing this in the light most favorable to the government, you're not going to view it that way. It was an isolated offense having no connection to the other charges because the bribery was just that one event where they bribed with fake ID surrounding the marriage to Aaliyah. And it did not occur within 10 years of any other predicate act that was sufficiently proven. The act is time barred. I don't know what the, what the, exact um, the, the, is. the there has to be a predicate act within 10 years of the racketeering charge. It's like a statute of limitations, but only no, you could have 10 acts as long as one of them is within the 10 years, you've satisfied the statute. Racketeering Act 2, sexual exploitation of a child. Let's just jump down to the summary paragraph. The government failed to prove the defendant acted with the purpose of producing a visual depiction of that conduct. Although the jury was erroneously charged that the government could sustain a charge by proving that the purpose was transmitting a visual depiction, the statute requires something different. Indeed, producing is different by the statute as, I'm sorry, defined by the statute as producing, directing, manufacturing, issuing, publishing, or advertising. While the statute also prohibits the transmission of live visual depictions, the defendant was not charged with transmitting a live visual depiction, and there is no evidence that he did. Lastly, the party stipulation that the film was used in VHS tapes was a type of film that was not produced in Illinois is insufficient to prove, prove by a reasonable doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, I think is what they mean, that the conduct was recorded on a device. So saying the stipulation was not good enough to show it was recorded on a device. I'm not, I don't, not, not great. Racketeering Act 5, Man Act Violation by Geronda. All right, since we are losing steam and about halfway through the document at this point, we are going to take a timeout, cut this into two parts. This will be part one. Part two, we will finish this document together um, and go through the rest of this JOA and give our opinion as to whether or not we think R. Kelly has a chance to win. So thanks for listening. Leave your comments and your questions below and make sure you like your video, like this video on the way out. Thanks for watching this episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you like this content, please share it with your friends. Make sure you subscribe to our page and like our videos. If you want some interaction, get in the comments and we'll be sure to get back to you. If you want to know any more information about our firm or this page, you can find out in the description or visit tragoslaw.com. We post multiple times throughout the week, so make sure you hit that bell so you can get the notification and not miss out on the next episode.